and he, um, as you all know, has written many books. One of uh, the books about the thing, the ten things wrong with science, which has really stirred the pot. And this is what we need, is to stir that pot and really get the dialogue going. And Rupert definitely has, um, has achieved that. And I believe, Rupert, you've also created a uh, society, the, the Skeptics Against Skeptics. Um, so you might want to talk about that because I don't think everybody, I don't know if that was part of your talk, but you might give that to plug to the audience. Yes. Well, thank you. Um, is this working? Yes. <clears throat> thanks. Thanks for that. Um, just two small points about the introduction. The book is called *The Science Delusion* in England, and in America, it's called uh, *Science Set Free*. The website um, that Chantal referred to is something a group of us have set up. Um, which you might like to take a look at, www.skepticalaboutskeptics.org. Skeptical spent, uh, spelt in the way that the skeptics spell it with a K, the American spelling. Um, Skepticalaboutskeptics.org. Um, so um, I'm speaking this morning on the theme of the extended mind, um, which, by which I mean the mind beyond the brain. Um, the question I'm addressing is, where is the mind? And for most people within the academic uh, world, uh, it seems pointless asking that question because they think they already know the answer, the mind is in the brain. Mental activity is brain activity. This is the central assumption of the materialist philosophy or the materialist worldview. It's not been proved that the mind's nothing but the brain, it's assumed. And it's assumed on the basis that changes in the brain can affect the mind. Damage someone's brain, it affects their mental activity. Give them a lot of alcohol to drink, they behave differently. These things have been known for centuries, if not millennia. Um, but they don't prove that the mind is nothing but the brain, they prove that the brain has something to do with mental activity. And what I'm going to suggest this morning is that minds are much more extensive than brains. They stretch out far beyond brains um, through fields. Now, I'll leave the question of what kind of field till later. They're not talking about regular gravitational or electromagnetic or quantum fields, I'm talking about another kind of field. But let me first say that the idea of fields extending beyond material bodies is now completely mainstream in science. The field concept was first introduced by Michael Faraday in the 1840s with the idea of electric and magnetic fields. The magnetic field is inside a magnet, the material object, but stretches out invisibly beyond it. Uh, it's a region of space. The most general definition of, of a field is a region of spatial influence, a region of influence in space. The gravitational field of the Earth is inside the Earth, but stretches out invisibly beyond it, holding the moon in its orbit and holding us down on the floor in this room. Otherwise, we'd be floating around. We can't see it, but it's a region of influence in space. The electromagnetic field of your mobile telephone, currently switched off, um, is uh, inside the mobile telephone and stretches out invisibly beyond it. This room is full of electromagnetic transmissions from radio and mobile phones. And what I'm suggesting is that our minds are normally rooted inside our brains but extend far beyond them through mental fields. Now, the debate that about the nature of the mind has been colored for more than 300 years by Cartesian dualism. Descartes, as everyone knows, made a radical separation of spirit and matter, mind and body. The mind, Descartes thought, was not in space and time. Only humans had minds in the whole natural order. Animals didn't and everything else in nature was mechanical. The only other beings with minds or spirits 
uh, were God and angels. So God, angels, and human minds were not in space and time. But bodies, all matter, the whole of material reality, is in space and time. It raise extensor, extended things. The materialists in the 19th century uh, didn't like Cartesian dualism, so they denied the spirit pole and said the only reality is matter. Now, materialism is a philosophy that arises through the denial of the spirit pole of dualism. It's a very unsatisfactory dualism, um, but materialism is even more unsatisfactory in my view. What I'm suggesting is a third view, which is neither Cartesian view of disembodied spirit outside space and time, or materialism is just matter, but a third view which says the mind is extended in space, it's extended all around us, it's extended throughout our brains and bodies, um, uh, it's uh, extended through fields, and that the same applies to animal minds as human minds. This is not a special theory of human spirit. It's a theory of the nature of mental activity extended in space. Now, the easiest way to see what I'm talking about is to think of the nature of vision. What's happening when you see something? Um, like what's happening when you see me now? Well, you all know the standard textbook answer. Uh, it, lights reflected from me travels through the electromagnetic field, enters your eyes, inverted images form on your retinas, changes occur in the cone cells, impulses travel up the optic nerves, and changes occur in various regions of the brain, which can be described in great detail by fMRI and other scanning techniques. We know more uh, about the details of the changes in the brain than ever before. Well, that's very good as far as it goes, but what it does is just describes the changes that happen in the uh, eyes, nerves, and brain when you see something. It doesn't account for the two essential features of vision, which is, first of all, that you're conscious of what you see. This is an example of the, the hard problem. You ought not to be conscious of anything if matter's unconscious and you're made of nothing but matter. And many philosophers of mind have tried to pretend that we're not conscious. Um, it's just an illusion. But the question I want to talk about is not the hard problem, but the question of where these images are. When you see an image of me, you're seeing me, um, where is your image of me? Where is your image of the rest of this room and of everything you're seeing? Well, the standard view, the materialist view, is it's all in the brain, all your experiences in the brain. Uh, somehow, uh, when you see things, as the changes occur in the brain, electric quantum changes occur in nerve cells, uh, electromagnetic changes occur over large regions of the brain, as we were hearing yesterday. And then, somehow, your mind uh, or brain produces a 3D virtual reality display, display inside your head. Uh, which contains everything you're seeing in three dimensions and in full color, and it's all supposed to be inside your head. Now, how the brain or the electric fields in the brain generate this 3D uh, uh, electro uh, virtual reality display is left entirely unexplained. And no one has ever seen a 3D virtual reality display in a brain. When people open up brains for surgical operations, they don't see full color 3D displays of what that person is experiencing. Um, so that's the official view. And according to that view, somewhere inside your brain, there's a little Rupert uh, standing here in, in full color in three dimensions. And everything else you're seeing is inside your brain. When you look at the sky, the sky you're seeing is inside your brain. A recent paper in Brain and Behavioral Sciences uh, was entitled, Is Your Skull Beyond the Sky? And the author, who was a materialist philosopher of mind, answered the correct materialist answer, yes, your skull is beyond the sky that you're seeing because all your experience is inside your head. This is just a virtual skull produced within this uh, display inside your head. All your experience is in your head. Your skull is beyond the sky. This is the official view taught in all our universities and schools and taken for granted by uh, materialist philosophers and by most other people because that's what they've been taught to believe. But it do totally doesn't correspond with our experience. We experience our images as being outside ourselves. I experience 
what I'm seeing of you as being not inside my head. It's in my mind, interpreted by my mind, but not inside my head. It seems to be out there. And what I'm proposing is a hypothesis so simple that it's hard to understand. Your image of me is located right here, exactly where it seems to be. It's outside your head. It's uh, in your mind, but not in your brain. You project out the images of everything you're experiencing. Light comes in, changes occur in the brain, and images are projected out to where they seem to be. Now, sometimes they're projected out to where things are not. Then you have an illusion or a hallucination. That can happen. Um, but usually, they correspond with where things are. And if they didn't, we wouldn't have got here this morning. We'd have been bumping into things, and we'd be completely dysfunctional. I claim no originality for this hypothesis. It's the theory of vision put forward by Plato. It's the theory of vision put forward by Euclid, the great geometer who was the first person to explain mirror images. Euclid argued that the light is bent, that the light reflected off the mirror comes into your eyes, but you project out your virtual images that you're seeing, and because they're virtual, they go straight through the glass and you see them behind the mirror. Um, so every time you look in the mirror, you're seeing your own visual projections. So um, this is also the view taken by traditional peoples all over the world. And it's the view uh, that children have in our own culture. Jean Piaget, the developmental psychologist, showed that until the age of about 10, children uh, think that vision involves an outward projection of images. That's why in Superman comics, he's shown having rays go out of his eyes. And uh, uh, Roald Dahl's story, Matilda, uh, uh, appeals to children very strongly because she has eye beams that can move things. But as Piaget said, by the age of 10 or 11, the average child learns the correct view, which is that thoughts and images are invisible things located inside the head. So uh, we've all been brought up to deny our most immediate experience of the world in favor of an untested hypothesis that's nothing but an assumption that dates back to 17th century science. Uh, there was a, a theoretical or metaphysical assumption rather than an empirical uh, one. So uh, what I'm suggesting is that this is how vision works, that our minds are radically uh, external in the act of vision. Now, this is now a fairly fashionable position within philosophy of mind. It's sometimes called radical externalism. Um, and this is now a, a hot topic of debate. Um, until fairly recently, most people took for granted it's all inside the head. But this is no longer the case. Uh, uh, there's a much wider debate about this but it's usually treated as a philosophical debate. I treat it as an empirical hypothesis. If our minds stretch out beyond our brains, and if there are fields, however we conceive of them, fields of mental fields or perceptual fields that stretch out containing these images, when we look at something, our mind may affect what we look at because it reaches out in a sense to touch it. If I look at a distant star, my mind may reach out over astronomical distances and probably years backwards in time as well. Um, if I look at you from behind and you don't know I'm there, the question is, could you pick up the feeling that you're being looked at by me uh, just because my mind is reaching out to touch you? Even if I'm looking through a window, even if there's no sound and no smell, is it conceivable that people could feel when they're being looked at from behind? This would be an empirical test. Now, as soon as you ask that question, you realize this is an everyday phenomenon. It's not paranormal or weird. It's not strange and bizarre like D.D. Hume uh, floating up in a sales room. It's an everyday phenomenon experienced by most people. Surveys have shown that over 90% of the population have had this experience, including children. Um, there's a slight sex difference. More women than men have experienced being stared at. More men than women have experienced staring at others and making them turn around. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, almost everybody's had this experience. I call it the sense of being stared at. The scientific name for it is scopesthesia. Scop as in looking, aesthesia as in feeling. So, um, does it really happen? 
Everyone who's been to university and trained in the skeptic materialist worldview has a ready answer. No, of course it doesn't really happen. You just turn around all the time and if someone catches your eye, you imagine that they've made you turn around, but you just forget the millions of times you're wrong. This is the standard armchair skeptical explanation. And it's inhibited research on this subject for a long time. This is such a taboo topic that until about 1985, there had be only been four papers in the published literature uh, on this phenomenon. All four had shown positive effects, but two were by skeptics who tried to explain them away. Um, since the 1980s, there's now been quite a lot of research on this subject. Many of the experiments uh, are so simple that a child can do them. And indeed, many of them have been done by children. They've been done extensively in schools in Britain, Germany, and in the United States. There have now been hundreds of thousands of these trials. Uh, the uh, evidence is summarized in a review paper of mine in the Journal of Consciousness Studies 2008. You can find the full text on my website. So I'm not going to go into the experimental details. Basically, the experiment involves the subject who wears a, a blindfold, like an airline blindfold, to eliminate peripheral vision. Uh, the looker sits behind them and, in a randomized series of trials, either looks or doesn't look. And the beginning of the trial is signaled by a bleep or a click. The uh, subject, within 10 seconds, has to guess if they're being looked at or not. They're right or they're wrong. By chance, they'd be right 50% of the time. In this huge series of experiments, the average hit rate's about 55%. Not a big effect, but massively significant statistically. Some people, of course, are more sensitive than others. But this is an overall effect of unselected subjects. These experiments have been done all over the world, including here in Sweden. Some people in this room took part in an experiment I ran in Sweden 10 years ago or so, 15 years ago, maybe. Um, some of these experiments have been done through one-way mirrors and through windows to eliminate any lingering possibility that could be sounds or smells giving clues. And this experiment, a computerized version, has been running in the Amsterdam Science Museum, the NEMO Center, for the last 20 years, one of the biggest experiments ever conducted, um, with overwhelmingly positive, statistically significant results. The most sensitive subjects in that experiment, as indeed in my own, are children under the age of 10. Um, most adults get rather, I think, almost thick-skinned. You know, we're exposed to lots of people in modern cities. Children are more sensitive to this. And children are very interested in the phenomenon, which is why it's been quite easy to do it in primary schools. School teachers are also interested because one of their tricks of the trade is to stare hard at a naughty boy in the back row who's turned around and very quickly the children turn back again. Um, as Etzel uh, said in his talk, um, the, uh, these experiments have also been done using closed circuit television. Um, uh, can people uh, in another room, uh, even in another building, uh, are looked at or not looked at uh, in a randomized sequence, and there are physiological changes in skin conductance uh, showing that uh, they're physiologically uh, aroused when they're being stared at by someone in a different room. A few weeks ago, I launched for the first time an online staring experiment that I invite all of you to try if you can. Uh, it involves two people. You can be in distant places on a computer. It uses your computer camera as in a Skype type. Um, uh, photography, and you, uh, you're, if you're the subject, you're looked at by another person or by many other people in different parts of the world uh, in a series of trials. You have to guess if you're being looked at or not. I don't know the results yet because the experiment's only been running uh, three weeks so far, but uh, do have a go. It's on my website, www.sheldrake.org. It turns out that animals also uh, are sensitive to being stared at. Many wildlife photographers and hunters have noticed this. Um, and uh, uh, I think that this phenomenon uh, is easily explained in evolutionary terms in the context of predators and prey. Any prey animal that could feel when a predator was looking at it um, would have an advantage compared with a prey animal that could not tell when a predator was looking at it. It's a useful ability. Um, 
It's also well known, in, I've interviewed a lot of people who spend their time looking at other people, um, surveillance officers, the store detectives at Harrods, the Heathrow drug squad, and so forth, um, anti-terrorist -ter surveillance uh, personnel. Uh, among such people, it's completely taken for granted that this happens. Um, even with CCTV, when I was looking into this, I subscribed to the trade journals. Probably very few of you read Surveillance Weekly or CCTV Today. Um, but um, these are, in, in that world, uh, people take this stuff for granted. In the martial arts, they have ways of training people to become more sensitive to being looked at from behind. It's useful to know if someone's looking at you from behind and creeping up to attack you. So I think it, it's, it's probably widespread in the animal kingdom. It hasn't been investigated by naturalists or by animal behavior people because the taboo on this subject is so immense. Although it's totally well known, the taboo is enormously strong against investigating these things because conventional scientific thinking is hemmed in by a whole series of dogmas and beliefs uh, which make people feel you shouldn't look at these things because they can't possibly exist. Now, similar taboos apply to telepathy. Telepathy um, literally means distant feeling. Tele means distant, pathy means feeling, as in sympathy, empathy. And I think telepathy is also a basically biological phenomenon that animals uh, uh, have, not just humans, that many species have this. And I think that telepathy is a, a function of the bonding that occurs between animals in social groups. Social animals, by definition, live in societies and have to interact with other members of their social group. Uh, the idea of um, morphic fields, which is not, I, I'm not talking about the nature of these fields today, just mentioning them. Um, uh, the idea is that this is a basic holistic model of how nature is organized. Everything in nature is organized in a nested hierarchy. Um, these small circles could be subatomic particles in atoms. Those could, the next circles could be molecules. The next ones could be crystals. At each level, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. Um, and the uh, wholeness at each level, that which organizes the wholeness, is what I call a morphic field. Morphic from the Greek word morphe, meaning shape or form the organizing field. Now, social animals um, are within groups. And if you think of the innermost, the, the, the three biggest circles inside the outer circle as individual animals, then the outer circle is the field of the social group. So I think social groups of animals uh, are indeed organized by social fields, uh, which are morphic fields, invisible organizing fields, Analogous to magnetic fields, which are invisible organizing fields, they organize, say, iron filings around a magnet. The iron filings automatically take up position within that invisible organizing field. And I think similar fields organize flocks of birds. This is a flock of starlings over Brighton West Pier. And um, here are more pictures of flocks of starlings where the birds can change direction extraordinarily fast. Um, detailed analysis has shown they do it too quickly to uh, do it by the obvious way of just looking around, seeing where the neighbors are going. Not only do they need to know where their neighbors are, they need to know where their neighbors are going to go to avoid bumping into them. They do it too fast to do it just by looking at their neighbors and uh, uh, certain uh, simplistic computer models treat it as if it's just a matter of looking at neighbors and adjusting to the average neighbor speed and direction. That doesn't work. The best computer models today treat the whole thing as a field phenomenon uh, analogous to iron filings in a magnetic field or uh, to flow patterns in fluids, uh, which again are field models. The same applies to schools of fish, uh, which swim together uh, in a way where, and they can change direction very rapidly without bumping into each other. What I'm suggesting is that animal groups have these fields that link together the members of the group um, and that these bonds between the members of the group through these morphic fields of the group uh, act as a channel of communication. 
Now, if members of the group separate from other animals, then the field doesn't disappear, it stretches. It, for example, if wolves um, have young, their cubs, they leave the cubs in a den and then the adult wolves go out hunting, ranging over hundreds of miles in the case of northern Canada. They go over enormous distances. The bond between them is not broken, but it stretches. And observations by naturalists of wolves suggest that uh, they can respond to what's happening to other members of their group many miles away, far beyond the range of hearing or smell. And I think this is because there's a kind of telepathic connection between them. I think telepathy is a normal form of communication within animal groups. They don't have mobile phones, they don't have the internet, they don't have text messages. Uh, and in order to coordinate the activities of separated members of the group, telepathy is what they use. It's a useful ability. That's why it's evolved. Um, that's my hypothesis. It's analogous to quantum entanglement. I don't say it's the same as quantum entanglement, uh, but it's worth mentioning the analogy. If two particles have been part of the same system, quantum system, and they move apart, they remain entangled or non-locally connected or non-separable non uh, according to the uh, principles of quantum mechanics. A change in one leads to an instantaneous change in the other. Um, and uh, this was opposed by Einstein who called it spooky action at a distance. But experiments have shown that spooky action at a distance really happens. Quantum theory is right, Einstein was wrong. Um, and uh, this does not fall off with distance. That's one of the interesting things about quantum non-locality. Unlike, say, the intensity of gravitation, which falls off according to an inverse square law, quantum non-locality does not. Now, telepathy is more analogous to quantum non-locality than to gravitation or uh, the diffusion of light from a point source. So, um, what I want to do now is talk about experimental investigations. Um, because I think it's common in animals, I started by looking at animal telepathy. Um, I think that telepathy, uh, to summarize this point, is normal, not paranormal, natural, not supernatural. Um, I think it's an animal ability that we share with many animal species. So because I think it's a, a, a natural part of animal life, uh, I started my investigations by looking at the animals we know best, dogs, cats, parrots, horses, domestic animals, which form bonds with their human owners. I start my research as a biologist with natural history. So I collect stories from people about their experiences. I now have more than 5,000 on my animal database. And the, um, th these uh, stories um, provide a, a natural history of what people believe about their animals. They don't prove these beliefs are true, but they uh, make it clear that there's a certain phenomena occur over and over again. For example, in this database, I have more than 200 cases where people say that their cats know when they're planning to take them to the vet. The cats disappear. Cats hate going to vets on the whole. And um, uh, many people have the problem that the cat simply vanishes when they want to take it to the vet. Um, so after this has happened a few times, people try to avoid letting the cat know when they're going to the vet. They, they don't let it see the cat basket. They try to avoid mentioning the word vet. The cat still seems to know. And some people in despair uh, ring the vet from work to make an appointment and then swing by so the cat can't overhear the conversation. And then they swing by home after uh, making the appointment to pick up the cat and take it to the vet, and it's just not there, it's hiding. Um, we heard so many of these stories, we did a survey of veterinary clinics in North London from the North London Yellow Pages, 65 veterinary clinics. We rang them all up and asked, uh, do you ever have a problem with people missing appointments with cats? 64 out of 65 said, yes, it happens all the time. And the 65th one said, uh, no, they said, we, it happens so often, we've given up the appointment system for cats. Uh, <laughs> well, the easiest to test 
of the many abilities of cats and dogs that suggest telepathic abilities is uh, dogs and cats that anticipate the arrivals of their owners. Many people have had the experience of their dog or cat seeming to know uh, when the owner's coming home. They go and wait at a door or a window. And again, um, when I discuss this with my sceptical friends, one of my uh, close friends in England is an outright sceptic, Nicholas Humphrey. Um, and I always discuss my experience with him first, because I prefer to get the sceptical input at the beginning rather than at the end. Um, <laughs> And uh, so when I said to him, I've got interest in dogs that know when their owners are coming home, uh, he said, instead of saying that doesn't exist, he said, oh, my dog used to do that. My mother always knew when I was coming home about half an hour in advance. So I said to him, well, Nick, your mother couldn't possibly, uh, your dog couldn't possibly have heard your car from 20 miles away the other side of Cambridge with a motorway in between. Um, and uh, so uh, it couldn't possibly be that. He said, oh, on the contrary, it just shows what sharp hearing they've got. <laughs> so <laughs> so um, uh, together we thought up a simple experiment, which I've now done uh, many times. Uh, we have people, we film the place the dog waits. We have people go at least eight kilometers from their home. Uh, they come home at randomly chosen times that they don't know in advance. We pick the time at random and ring them up on a mobile phone to tell them when to come. And to avoid familiar car sounds, they come in unfamiliar cars, uh, or usually taxis. Um, the most expensive aspect of this research are the taxi fares. Uh, um, so um, we also did surveys to find out how common this behavior is. Um, before doing this, we, we had the natural history from the database, then random household surveys. As you'll see, in uh, London and Ramsbottom in the north of England, about 50% of dogs um, uh, know when their owners are coming home. In Los Angeles and Santa Cruz, uh, again, uh, half or more of the dogs know when their owners are coming home. Fewer cats do it. For some reason, the American cats do it more than British cats. Um, but the overall average is about 50% of dogs and 30% of cats. Now, I don't think cats are necessarily less sensitive. Some of them are just less interested, um, <laughs> including, unfortunately, my own. Um, so um, in our experiments, we've done many of these videotaped experiments and some, again, all this is on in peer-reviewed journals. You can read the texts on my website. There's dozens of papers on these kinds of things I'm talking about. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to flash up the references here, but they're all there online, free of charge, on my website. Um, uh, this shows the results of uh, average results from three uh, a series of experiments with a dog that knows when its owner's coming home. Um, the, is this a pointer? Um, oh no, oh dear. Um, is that, oh, that's a pointer, good. Thanks very much. Um, this is a long series of experiments. These are 10 minute periods since the person went out. And this is the number of seconds per 10 minute period that the dog spent at the door or window. And with long absences, um, the dog did go to the door a bit to look at passing cats and uh, if there was a disturbance outside. Uh, they, so the dogs didn't just never go to the door. Uh, but this is the first 10 minutes of the homeward journey. And this is the 10 minutes before that. Of course, the owner is thinking of going home before they get in the car or taxi. Uh, they have to ring the taxi, for example, to make a booking. So their mind is already fixed on going home before they actually set off. Uh, and that's this period here. What you see is they're at the window much more when they're on the way home than when they're not. This is medium absences. And again, we see the same pattern. You, you see, the point of this is that if dogs just got anxious when their owner was out and went to the window more and more, depending on how long they'd been out, in this case, in the long absences, they should be at the window a lot more. And these are short absences. You see here, at the, before, the 10 minutes before and the time they're coming home, 
In here, there's very little effect. So the dog's response uh, occurs uh, in response to when the owner's coming home. We did control experiments over four-hour periods when the owner was not coming home at all, and the uh, line is virtually flat. So um, this evidence, quantitative, highly significant effect, suggests the dogs really do know when their owners are coming home. When this research came out, I was, of course, challenged by the skeptics. Skeptics are not real skeptics, at least the ones I know. Uh, they're believers in the materialist worldview, and they use their critical powers to try and destroy any evidence that goes against their belief system. One of Britain's leading skeptics at the time was uh, a psychologist called Richard Wiseman. And um, Wiseman said, well, obviously my experiments were flawed because I hadn't used randomized times, I hadn't used the right kind of unfamiliar vehicle, and so forth. Um, so I invited him to do his own experiments with this dog. He did three experiments in the same location as where I did mine with the same dog. Uh, his results were proclaimed in the British press. Psychic dogs fail to give scientists a lead. Psychic pet phenomenon refuted. No truth in psychic powers. Um, these claims were made on the basis of results which he didn't publish the graphs of. He just said, oh, the dog's gone to the window before uh, the person set off to come home. Um, and so um, the, they've gone to the window. These are in my experiments. Our dog that went to the window before the owner came home, he said, this is a false alarm and all the rest of the results are disqualified. It's failed the test. When you look at his data, his published data plotted on a graph the same way as mine, you see exactly the same pattern. And this is what he proclaimed in the press uh, as a refutation of this phenomenon. And you see, skeptics are incredibly credulous when it comes to the claims of other skeptics. They want to believe that this is impossible, and they'll believe these refutations. They won't look at the data. Wiseman and I have had a long uh, series of exchanges on this. We've published papers analyzing each other's data. You can read all this, it's online. And most independent observers who've analyzed this controversy have concluded uh, that Wiseman's data actually replicate rather than refute my own. Even he now concedes that they show exactly the same pattern. Now, um, this same principles of uh, telepathy, I think, apply to humans. And again, with humans, I started not from laboratory parapsychology, but from a collection of stories, again about 5,000 stories from humans about their psychic experiences. One group of stories were from mothers and babies. Many mothers claim they know when their baby needs them. If they're nursing mothers, their milk lets down um, just before, uh, when they're away from the baby, if they feel their milk lets down, their breasts squeeze out milk, it's an oxytocin mediated milk let down response. Um, uh, most mothers assume their baby needs them. They used to just go home. Now they ring home on their mobile phone. And they're usually right. Uh, I had hundreds of stories, and I did surveys of nursing mothers um, with the help of a midwife who worked for me, um, uh, showing this is a very common phenomenon. Now, you see, when people say, if to let us say any good, what's the use? It's a very useful thing for a mother to know when her baby needs her at a distance. Before the invention of telephones, uh, Mothers who knew when their baby needed them would have babies that survived better than mothers that didn't know when they uh, needed them. Um, before the invention of telephones, telepathy was the only way of alerting people to needs at a distance. Um, I've done a series of empirical studies with mothers and nursing babies. I summarize these in my book, The Sense of Being Stared At and Other Aspects of the Extended Mind. I summarized the animal research and many other animal experiments in my book, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home, and other unexplained powers of animals. Um, but by far the commonest kind of telepathy in the modern world occurs in connection with telephone calls. And the um, uh, uh, surveys show that over 80% of uh, people uh, have had uh, telephone telepathy experiences, you think of someone, they then ring, and you say, that's funny, I was just thinking of you. 
This has been going on ever since the invention of the telephone. But for 100 years, armchair skeptics managed to inhibit research by the standard armchair skeptical argument, oh yes, well, you may think it's telepathy, but in fact what's happening is it's just a coincidence. You think about people all the time. If one of them rings, then uh, you think it's telepathy and you just forget the millions of times you're wrong. You've all heard that argument, I'm sure. Um, many of you may have made it. Um, I used to myself when I was an anti-telepathy skeptic during my atheist phase as a, uh, in my 20s. Um, and um, so, um, but then I asked these skeptics, where's the data? You know, in science, you, it's not enough to have a hypothesis. You need the data. I found that no data at all. No one had ever investigated it. Um, I've set up a series of experiments which are quite simple. Um, they're statistical experiments. We find people who know, uh, who say this happens to them quite often. Uh, they sit at home being filmed with a landline telephone, no caller ID display. They give us the names and phone numbers of four people they know well. We pick one of them by the throw of a die or by a random number generator, ring them up and ask them to phone their friend. The phone rings. Um, and before they pick it up, they have to guess who it is. I think it's Mary. They pick it up, hello, Mary. They're right or wrong. By chance, they'd be right 25% of the time, one in four. Well, in these experiments... Um, oh, we seem to have got into some glitch. Um, yes? What do you say? Well, it isn't. I started five minutes late, so I'm going on five minutes longer. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is the allowed time, yes. Um, <laughs> so, um, to, to this, um, in these experiments, the actual hit rate in the filmed trials was uh, 45%. Um, in film trials, 40, compared with 25% by chance, that's the, um, that's the chance level, that's the actual hit rate. The p-value here is 1 times 10 to the minus 12. This phenomenon is more significant than the existence of the Higgs boson. Uh, and um, the, uh, we then did uh, experiments where we compared familiar and unfamiliar callers. Telepathy occurs between people who are emotionally bonded, not with strangers. One of the problems with a lot of parapsychology tests is they take complete strangers. You saw the card guessing test with Ryan. He had random volunteers with him. Uh, they weren't bonded with him. In real life, it happens between husbands and wives, mothers and babies, parents and children, best friends, close colleagues, etc. In these with four uh, telephone uh, uh, tests, uh, four callers, we had two familiar and two unfamiliar callers in a series of trials. And with the familiar, oh, sorry about that. Um, with the familiar callers, um, the hit rate was over 50%. With the unfamiliar callers, only just above chance, which is what you'd expect. Uh, given the nature of telepathy. And that, by the way, is why uh, when John Joe said yesterday, why don't poker players know what the other person's thinking? They're not usually bonded. Uh, they're usually highly competitive. Uh, in bridge, where people play in teams, uh, there's a lot of evidence for telepathic communication between partners in games of bridge. So it happens in bridge, but not in poker. Um, now, um, this, um, with these uh, results... Uh, I summarize here. Um, it's a new way of testing for telepathy. The results are highly significant and positive. There's no effect of distance. We did these experiments. We recruited young subjects in, uh, from Australia and New Zealand who are living in London. Two of their callers were down under in Australia or New Zealand. The other two were new acquaintances in England. They did better, very significantly better, with their nearest and dearest down under rather than people in England, showing that f physical proximity is less important than emotional closeness. Uh, these experiments have been replicated at the universities of Amsterdam and Freiburg, and in an, an experiment for television I did with the Nolan sisters, a 1980s girl band, I have a film of that, but we're not going to be able to see it because the coffee break's going to begin within seconds. Um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> 
Um, very good for student projects. It's an agreement with common experience. I do a lot of my research on what I call the mysteries of everyday life, things that almost everybody knows about, but which there's a culture of denial about within academic science, only in public. When I talk to most of my academic scientific friends, they're normal people, and so they say, oh yes, that happens to me. Um, you know, or my dog knows when I'm coming home from the lab, uh, and so on. Uh, but they can't say it to their colleagues because it's not a permitted topic. Um, the, um, there's now um, um, not only an online staring experiment I mentioned that's on my website, I now have an automated telephone telepathy test that works on mobile phones. Anyone can do it. You need two people to do this as well as yourself. www.sheldrake.org. Have a go. And we've done experiments with email telepathy with very similar results to telephone telepathy, way above chance. Uh, the scores, highly significant. This is P times 1 to the 20, 10 to the 29, minus 29. These are the most, uh, oh dear, it's gone into this, uh, it's gone on strike again. Um, but um, basically, um, the email telepathy shows exactly the same phenomenon. Thank you. Um, uh, familiar callers, um, more effective than unfamiliar callers, no effect of distance. We've done the same thing with SMS messages, exactly the same kinds of results and principles. Again, you can find all these papers on my website. So, um, in summary, um, there, I think there's a lot of evidence that our minds are extended beyond our brains um, through attention and intention. The very words give us a clue. Ad tendere is the Latin root of attention. It means to stretch towards. Intention means to stretch into. I think our minds stretch out in accordance with our attention and intention and can affect others at a distance. I think they're also extended in time, but that's not a subject I have a time to talk about now. Um, but I think as soon as you get beyond the idea that the brain, the mind is nothing but the brain, the dogma that it's nothing but the brain, which is the reason that skeptics are so against these phenomena. They're so keen to get the mind and the brain because they think, because that's their materialist belief system. Um, I'm trying to persuade my skeptic friends in England, it's no big deal to think of the mind as extended through fields beyond the brain. This is, they're perfectly happy with fields in every other area of activity. And instead of a vain opposition to these phenomena, trying to hide, hide, turn back what most people believe because they've experienced it in the name of dogma, it's much better to accept these things and investigate them scientifically. And I think this is much better for science as well. So, um, um, I think our minds are extended beyond our brains. There's a symposium tomorrow afternoon where we'll be exploring this idea further. Thank you. We have time for two short questions, maybe. Or Thank you very much. My name is Riccardo Manzotti, and I'm a radical externalist. So you mentioned them at the beginning. I have a very simple question. Uh, if the mind stretches outside of the brain, I assume that you take the mind to be different both from the brain and from the object it stretches to. So my question is, uh, in your view, what is, the what is the mind made of, basically, if it is not made neither by say, neural activity, nor, I assume, by the external object it stretches to. Thank you very much. Well, it would take a long time to go into the basis of my morphic field theory, but I think that they're basically field phenomena. You see, I think the, the brain has fields. We know, we heard yesterday about quantum fields and also electromagnetic fields in the brain. I think these are the interface with more extended fields that stretch that are within the brain and stretch out beyond it, just as magnetic fields are within magnets and stretch out beyond them. It's not a dualistic concept. Um, and so I think these are field phenomena. Um, I think our minds are made of fields. Um, that's, what I, that's my answer, short answer. Yeah, uh, I'm relating to that question a bit form formulated a bit differently. Uh, would you say there is 
if there were no people and no animals, would there be mind? Um, well, yes. I mean, it take, this is the, the much, much bigger question of, is there consciousness, is the whole universe totally unconscious except in human brains and possibly the brains of higher animals here on Earth where the light bulb of consciousness is switched on in complex brains, whereas everything else is unconscious? Or does consciousness come first? Is the whole universe conscious and is there a consciousness underlying nature? Whether you call it ultimate consciousness, God, uh, Buddha mind or whatever. Um, I, I think there is. So I think that consciousness is far more extensive than what occurs just in human brains. Um, so uh, I think consciousness is, I'm not an idealist, but I think consciousness underlies all nature and permeates all nature. Hi. Um, I want to make a couple of points. First, um, you made a statement that starling bird flock behavior can't be accounted for by science. I'm looking at a Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, one of the most prominent journals in the world, publication in 2014, role of projection in the control of bird flocks. And they've done simulations, and what they tested was whether birds are able to perceive the flock by looking at the opacity between the flock and the sky. Now, that's been published two years ago, and it gives perfect simulations of starling motion. So science can account for starling motion by perfectly conventional mechanisms. The other point I wanted to make is that uh, I'm looking, obviously putting up graphs is fine. You can do that at a meeting, but ultimately science is judged by peer-reviewed journals. As you know, you have published recently a paper uh, on uh, joint attention and you got the kind of effect size that um, um, our previous speaker got of about um, 0.02% in, in that. Now, the question I want to ask, with effect sizes this big in properly controlled trials of, of maybe two times in a hundred, you might get the right answer. Would anyone notice that? How would an individual notice that they're getting the right answer correctly, two times in a hundred, 98 times they get it wrong, twice they get it right, how would they know that they're telepathic? I mean, these are such small effects that all of the things that you're talking about, how would you know that, how would people have learned that they're telepathic? It's too small an effect. Well, there's two separate questions here. The modeling of starling flocks, there are a lot of papers on it. Uh, there are field models. There are the, thing, oh, oh, the opacity may be one way of trying to measure the density of the flock, but it doesn't tell you where the birds are going to move to. It only tells you where they are now. And the whole point about avoiding collision is not only knowing where they are now, but where they're going. And so this is a complex subject. There's a big literature, I agree. There's a lot of modeled papers in PNAS and other journals. But, you know, it's not this is, refutes what you're saying. It's not like that. I mean, uh, now when it comes to the size of effects, with dogs that know when their owners are coming home and mothers knowing when their babies need them, these are very repeatable phenomena that people actually depend on in real life. They certainly notice them. When it comes to joint attention, um, joint attention is a phenomenon that's not telepathy, it's something else. It's not been investigated as far as I know until my recent experiments, and I didn't mention them today because it's a whole other subject. The joint attention is, can you tell when someone else is looking at the same thing? And the, um, in real life, uh, the real life phenomenon is what I call the evening standard phenomenon. You're on the London tube in Russia, someone's reading the evening standard newspaper, you read it over their shoulder, and they somehow pick up, you're looking at the same thing, and then they turn around looking angrily at you. Um, <laughs> now, I've done tests on that in real life, and with positive effects. Um, now, I've now tried a computerized test where people at a distance see uh, the same picture or a different picture in a series of trials. Can you tell if your partner's looking at the same picture or not? That is an effect which online is the very first time it's been tested. Um, and it's a question to see whether it can actually function online. I'm not there looking at a phenomenon which I think has evolutionary significance because 
looking at the same thing online is not an, an evolutionary selected for phenomenon. I'm interested there in whether or not the phenomenon exists. I think it does, but it's, as you say, a weak effect. But uh, you see, the, the kinds of telepathic effects that I think are the most interesting ones are the ones that occur in real life on a big scale, like mothers and babies, and telephone telepathy. Um, until the invention of the telephone, the only way you could tell if someone wanted to get in touch with you was by telepathy. It's about needs. It's not about information transfer on the whole. Um, so, yes, it's a small effect. But I think it's better to find a small effect, and I'm now investigating it to see if we can increase the effectiveness of these experiments. What factors might make this a bigger effect? You see, the, to take the line, it's so small, don't bother about it, is again a way of damping down research. I'm actually trying to open up rather than close down a line of inquiry. Yes, if you have emotionally, this point is from, if you have, the other thing, the, yes, the, my joint attention test can be done with random strangers. Um, they work much better if you do it with closely bonded people. So, um, so uh, that's one factor I'm looking at. So this is an open question. I mean, it's a question for further investigation in my view, rather than an argument against the phenomenon. Mm. Uh. So, sorry, um, I can't hear. I think even, yes, I, I speak, yes. I think even animals feel when you are looking at them. And even what you're thinking about. My son has 60 cows. And they call on their cows. And there is, oh, moo, moo. And... Is the cop here? Moo. That's just right. No other car. No, no other cars. Just their cars. How they can hear that? And um, when he comes with their her car and uh, or tractor, all the cars. Moo. That's in his concern. Why can't they hear just he, her, her he, him? Tractor, just that, just that loud. Mm. Thank you. I have one question. I, Nick Bostrom has said that we're living in a computer game, inside it, a computer game, and this couldn't explain the consciousness and everything else. What do you think about this theory? Um, well, I don't take very seriously the idea that we're living inside a computer simulation. Um, you know, in a way, it's, it's a kind of modern technological metaphor for living in a conscious world. Uh, you know, it's, it's the people keep trying to rediscover God and the idea there's a consciousness underlying all things. And this seems to me a clumsy modern metaphor for that idea. Um, I think that the idea that we're living in a computer simulation implies there's a computer programmer out there that's created this program that we're living in. And I just think there are much better ways of thinking of God. Um, so the, um, I don't think it's terribly helpful. However, at the moment I'm exploring the possibility of doing some of these uh, experiments in the context of computer games uh, where people who make choices in computer games might be precognitive in making the right choice. And if some of these tests that we've been talking about, both Etzel and myself, uh, were actually built into computer games, people would be doing experiments without knowing it and would actually be in a much more natural way um, uh, taking part. You see, one of the problems, again, to come back to John Joe's point, is that if you ask people to do these tests consciously with forced choices, you force them into a state of self-consciousness and doubt, which inhibits the phenomenon you're studying. Um, dogs 
don't get forced into that state, they just go on into anticipating their owner's arrivals. And unlike card guessing games, um, they never get bored of their owners coming home. They go on doing it over and over again. And if people are doing it when they're very engaged in computer games, without saying, you now have a forced choice and you may be right, you may be wrong, we're testing your intuitive abilities. If they're just guessing which door to go through, uh, it's much more likely to give positive and impressive results, in my view. So I think there is a role for computer games, but not quite the idea that we're in one. Okay, then, hello. Thanks for the fascinating talk. Continuing on, on the early, earlier question. Yesterday we had a great talk by Anirban and uh, speaking about fractal geometries as uh, information theory and uh, the universal language of the universe. So what do you think about, about that theory and uh, presentation? So are the fractal geometries the language of the universe and basis of the fields you are representing as morphogenetic uh, fields? I don't know. I was very intrigued by Amoban's talk, and, um, but I didn't completely understand it. You know, it was in an abstract formulation that I'm not familiar with. It would take me a long time to understand exactly what he's saying. Uh, but I hope that the view he's putting forward, which is of interconnectedness uh, within the universe, would in fact include phenomena like this. But after all, he's starting from rhythmic patterns in protein molecules, and I'm starting from the behavior of animals and people. So they're very different starting points. It would be wonderful if our general approaches overlap, and they might do, but I, I just can't say more than that at the moment. Yes, I have a question. <clears throat> I think it's very puzzling, this, uh, the sense of being stared at, that it also works via closed circuit uh, TV that uh, you know when someone is looking at you through, uh, on a TV um, because then you, they are not looking at you, they are looking at an image of you yes. or, or a representation of you. Would that work with a photograph as well or is the sim uh, simultaneously in time, is that the important key? Well, I've done experiments with photographs to look at exactly this point. I've done both real life experiments with people in different rooms where you look at their photograph um, or not and they have to guess if you're doing looking at it. I've also done online photograph experiments and the result of those is that when people know each other well the results are positive. It's a kind of telepathic effect. Um, when they don't know each other well they are very weak effects with photographs. Um, there's a really interesting experiment which hasn't happened yet would be with television. If you can, with closed circuit television, if you can tell when one person's looking at you in another room, what if a million people are looking at you on television? And now you could do that experiment. Say you had four well-known celebrities who are used to being on television. and You have cameras running on all four. You explain to the audience this is an experiment and you say, right, trial one, and one of them is shown to a million people and the other three are not. You can monitor their skin resistance, you also ask them to guess. Um, if uh, that works, um, that could be a live experiment in which the viewers of the experiment would also be participants. I think it would be extremely exciting. Um, and I have had several TV companies interested in doing this, but whenever they talk to their scientific advisors, they say, oh, this is pseudoscience, don't touch it with a barge pole and stuff. So it hasn't actually happened yet, because again, a dogmatic obstruction to free inquiry has inhibited it but it could be done and I hope it will be done because I think it would be completely fascinating and it would show that when people are in the public eye uh, that being in the public eye can affect them. So could we go back to the swarms of fish um, and the morphic field? So you mentioned two things. One, you mentioned the analogy with entanglement. So this knowing where they're going to go in the future. So you one makes a decision, they're not bumping into each other. And the other thing you mentioned was telepathy. So I'm wondering if I've understood that correctly, so that if this is some kind of an organizing field that both this sort of analogy to entanglement and telepathy are involved. Well, I think the organizing fields of social groups, um, it's where the whole system works as a unit. I mean, every morphic unit is so a whole more than some of the parts has interconnections between the parts. 
Now, in quantum theory, we call it entanglement. Um, I don't like to say the morphic field of the whole group of animals is quantum entanglement because that's jumping many levels. I think it's analogous to quantum in how the field works. Um, I don't. I don't completely know. I mean, these, I think there are such fields. I think we. You see, I think we have to, as a matter of procedure in science, you have to recognize the existence of a phenomenon before you investigate it further. You see, when Faraday put forward the idea of electric and magnetic fields, he didn't know how they worked. Um, and, and it was 20 or 30 years before James Clerk Maxwell came up with his equations. And he thought they worked in terms of the ether. And then decades later, Einstein showed the ether doesn't exist. Um, so we, he changed the equations of electromagnetism. Um, so we can't expect in any of these areas a fully formed theory that in any other branch of science takes several centuries to develop. Yes. Yes. All right. Let's give Rupert a great. Uh, we're out of time. I'm. I'm so sorry. Um, I, I. I believe we could have gone for another hour before. Well, I still.